You're listening to the Vocabit Podcast, where I help students improve their vocabulary for the SAT, ACT, and life itself using my unique and research-backed story-based method. On this podcast, I'm sharing the best tips and tricks for a more enriched vocabulary and pain-free test day. Hello, and welcome to episode 75 of the Vocabit Podcast. I'm Erica Abbott, a former English and history teacher, the author of the young adult novel Ahead of Her Time, and the founder of the eponymously named vocabulary company Vocabit. We are wrapping up our Remarkable Women miniseries today, and I'll tell you why in the next episode. But I want to end the series with a slightly more relatable woman for those of us who weren't born into royalty like Ethel Fled or probably will never become pirates like Anne Bonny. Today, I want to talk about Margot Durrell. If you've seen the Durrells in Corfu, which if you're in the United States is on PBS Masterpiece, she's the daughter in the show. And I've talked about this show in the podcast before because I just love it. It's based on a true story. I actually didn't love the first season because I found the kids all really annoying. But from season two on, I loved every minute and every character. But in the show, Margot, who again was a real person, this show is based on true events, She's portrayed as slightly dim, and she kind of was, she admits this in her own book, but that doesn't mean that she didn't live an extraordinary life. Margot had her mom to thank for planting many of these seeds because in the mid-1930s, when Margot was just 16, her mom was like, OMG, England is so boring, let's move to Greece. And so Margot's mom, a widow with four children, packed up the family and moved them to Corfu, a Greek island. Honestly, mom deserves an equal place on this list. We know about all of this because the youngest of the four kids, Gerald, went on to become a famous naturalist who cavorted with Princess Margaret, prevented a number of species from becoming extinct, and went on to write a famous series of books about their time in Corfu. The first one is called My Family and Other Animals. And apparently these books are just classics in the UK. They're the books that kids basically grow up reading. But they're also on some recommended reading lists in the U.S., usually as kind of one of the supplementary books. Here's your required book and pick one from 100 of these supplementary books. So Gerald gets a lot of the fame, but Margot's story is, I think, just as interesting. So let's pick up the thread of Margot's story in the late 1930s. She's been living in Corfu for a few years now, and those of you with a strong sense of chronology will probably be aware that World War II is imminently approaching. When the drums of war started sounding, most of the family relented and returned to England, or at least agreed to leave Corfu. But Margot was like, no, this is my home now. I'm not leaving. I love it here. So even though she spoke very little Greek, she disguised herself as a Greek woman and went to live with some of her friends in the village. Around this time, she also fell in love with a man in the Royal Air Force who was stationed in Corfu. I wouldn't be surprised if she fell in love first and decided to stay after. But the 1940s sees her married to a guy who's like, listen, I love you, I love your bravery, but you seriously cannot stay in Corfu anymore. The Nazis are coming. So when he was stationed in South Africa and various other places throughout the war, Margot finally agreed to leave and accompany him. The next part of the story is something that I, with an admitted sense of schadenfreude, really want to know more about. There's not a lot of information available about this part of the story. But the bare bones facts are that sometime during World War II, Margot ended up pregnant and a prisoner of war in Ethiopia. She was in a POW camp run by Italians, and when it was time to give birth, there were all of these complications. She had to have a C-section in a prisoner of war camp without any drugs. No anesthesia, no numbing cream, nothing. It honestly makes me want to cry just thinking about it. The nuns in the camp felt so bad that basically as soon as Margot could move, they smuggled her and her baby out to safety. By this point, Margot was like, okay, maybe there are worse things in the world than being bored in England. I think it's time to return to the home counties. So she moves back to Bournemouth, has another kid, gets divorced, which in and of itself was extremely brave considering it was the 1940s. And shortly after the war ended, she used a little bit of money that one of her aunts had left her to buy the house across the street from her mom. They remained a close family for the rest of their days. And Margot turned this house into a boarding house, as they call it in England. It's kind of like a bed and breakfast for those of us in the United States. And she very quickly reclaimed her joie de vivre. In a notoriously stuffy time and place, Margot threw her doors open to everyone. 
Her granddaughter, who spent a lot of time there, recalls that there was always Greek music playing. Her favorite lodgers were a gay couple, which today, no big deal. But again, this was the 1940s or 1950s. This is when Alan Turing basically saved the world from the Nazis, but because he was gay, was subjected to prosecution and horrific so-called treatment that basically killed him. So imagine being a gay couple and wanting to live together. Who's going to rent a place to you? It was basically impossible to do this openly, but Margot was like, come on in, have a drink. They're throwing parties all the time, according to her granddaughter. Her house was just a blast. And there were also always animals everywhere because Gerald didn't have enough money to open his first wildlife preserve yet. So he basically just kept a bunch of animals in her house and in her backyard. Margot's granddaughter, who is one of the best sources that we have on Margot's later life, she was interviewed about all of this, and I'll link the article in the show notes. I get a lot of these quotes from the Express. She said that Margot, quote, embraced everything and everybody, and you could talk to her about anything. She was a natural confidant, end quote. The granddaughter also talked about how Margot would take everyone camping, loading all the kids and grandkids in the back of the van, and they'd get there and she wouldn't have any food or supplies. She'd just be like, oh, what will we do for food? Which those of you who love the girls in Corfu can probably picture. The article continues, quote, Later, Tracy, the granddaughter, occasionally skipped school with friends, heading instead for Margot's beach hut. She would just sit with us and chat, Tracy said. She never asked why we weren't in school, end quote. Margot later wrote a book about these years called Whatever Happened to Margot? She never published it, but it was found and published posthumously after her death. And their family is, again, pretty famous in the UK. So basically everyone knew her from Gerald Durrell's Corfu trilogy. She was the sister in those books. So the title makes sense. By the time Margot was in her 50s, so this is the 1970s or so, she was like, all right, World War II is well in the rearview mirror. It's time to get back out there. So she responded to an ad for some random job on a Greek cruise ship. There are all these pictures of her in her 50s hanging out with 20-year-olds, sailing through Greece, just having a blast. By all accounts, Margot was a loving mother and a wonderful grandmother, but she also didn't abide by the dictates of society. She didn't let what was perceived to be normal control her life. You don't have to have an army to be remarkable. At the risk of sounding preachy, you just have to be kind and do what makes you happy. The Durrells were normal people who just wanted to live a more interesting life, and for generations, millions of people have looked up to them and admired them. It's pretty remarkable. All right, that's the last episode of this Remarkable Women mini-series for now. Be sure to tune in on Thursday for what's coming next. 